Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Jerry I'm an alcoholic, sober since January of 1973, and uh, I do have a different perspective. Uh, I have a resistance to some of the things that I'm not nearly as spiritual as Sandy. I hope you're not overly disappointed with that, but if you are, you're supposed to, you've heard the announcement, you're supposed to write him a letter or give him a note, and he will answer the damn questions right. And I took a lot of pressure off me. I will not answer your emails. I, I'm going to shoot my best shot here, and then I'm going to go away. Um, I've been told that certain of the answers that I propose to use are not acceptable. Like, it's a dumb damn question, and I'm not... uh, (laughs) Who in the hell asked that? Uh, Stand up and explain it. I want to know what you... Or I've wondered the same thing myself. Uh, I don't know is another one I plan to use a lot, so... um, (laughs) Who gives a damn is another one. Uh, (laughs) Well, there we are. Sandy did not do his job. He was supposed to do half of these, or maybe he gave me the bad ones. I don't know. We're going to find out right now. As he said, it's going to always be my point of view, I am no expert. I'm just one of the bunch. That's a long letter. Jesus. (laughs) I'll be selling 28 years next month. I'm finding that the older I get in sobriety, the fewer newcomers seem to attract, I I seem to attract to sponsor. Sponsorship has always been a high priority for me in maintaining my sobriety. In retrospect, I sponsored many, many men between my fifth and eleventh years. Um, From that point to the present, I have worked with fewer and fewer newcomers, this may be, or this or may not be, anything to do with the fact that I am the one place for the first 17 years and then moved to a different uh, area of the country every four or five years. My question is: Has anyone else experienced that they sponsor fewer than the the uh, elderly? The older they got is what it means. Could it be that the newcomers are more attracted to sponsors who have less time because they can better relate? Or maybe I need to look at myself. I can identify with that absolutely. I, um, I had to think back to the time I was coming into Alcoholics Anonymous and I was very big time lawyer and I, I had to protect my anonymity without all costs and so I wound up going to a little home group. Their baby had a year and a half, the next one had five years, and then they got serious about sobriety. They went 15, 20 years, you know. And those guys that had those years of sobriety, I'm, I'm hanging on by my fingernails, you know. I'm, I want to drink every day. And uh, I listen to them talk, and they're easy, and they're laughing, and it's comfortable. And I think well, those sandwiches don't need, they don't, they're not as bad drunk as I am. I, I need some real relief quick. And so I did not identify with them as well as I did a guy who walked in who had six months of sobriety. 
God, he had literature in every pocket. He had been to a treatment center. I hadn't had, couldn't, I couldn't risk my anonymity by going to treatment. So I was scurrying around the outskirts of AA, trying to, trying to get it. And he came in and he had all this letter, knew more about alcoholism than anybody I ever heard in my life. And I identified with him. He didn't sponsor me, but we became close buddies. What I've seen in my experience is that I have, as I've go, got more time in sobriety, uh, I have attracted fewer newcomers than I did before. But I have also picked up a lot of guys that their sponsors have died or moved or whatever. So I have had a fairly stable group of guys that I, I work with. Uh, the problems that they have are near like the problems that I am experiencing at the time. So I think the match is good. And I think that uh, there's nothing wrong with, with uh, that. If you want to work with newcomers, I think it's a good idea to get on the jail committee. Go talk to some guys that are being sent by the court or, you know, they don't have a hell of a lot of choice who they talk to. You get them in those little jumpsuits that they have, and they got to come in and sit down for an hour, and, you know, you can work on them. Uh, it makes me feel good. I don't know whether it helps them a damn bit or not, but it's a, it's a good thing to, uh, to do, and it does help me. I, I like to go to newcomers' meetings. Even if I'm not a part of the program in any way, I just hang around. And if I hear some guy ask a question somewhere, I can go over and say, you know, I, I had, that happened to me. And I, I, so I've had to adjust my approach. That's what it amounts to. And I, uh, I don't think I'm unique in that, but I may be. So there's somebody else here that disagrees with me. Will you raise, raise your hand so the rest of the group can go talk to you after this is over? <laughs> I don't want to talk to you anymore. I, <laughs> I really don't. I'll be glad to talk to anybody who wants to talk to me. Oh, God, I got a two-pager. Well, there's two little ones. When were the first and second letters written? When were the first and second letters written by Silkworth? Why were they both published? I don't know the answer to that question. I know they're both there. It, uh, they're written and put in the book. And the, uh, honestly, does anybody know whether the first and second letters were in the original big book? I have one, but I've never addressed that question. They were? I guess, I'd guess probably that uh, as the book was written, uh, Bill or somebody pointed out some points that maybe Dr. Silkworth helped them with, and so they... Instead of having him rewrite the first one, they just had him include a, a second one as though it came along a little later. Uh, I have no other explanation to that. Why would God give us the ability to doubt him? Damn if I know. Uh, <laughs> we're supposed to have free will, huh? Part of this journey through life seems to be the discovery of the need to have a power greater than yourself. And you need, I think, AA got it right when they had, as you understand him, because I think everybody has a different kind of thought or need for this person. When I first ran across the words in, in the book and saw in the steps, God was everywhere. And it really bothered me because I had a fundamental idea of God of some kind. I thought about God being an old man sitting on a cloud somewhere. On one side, he had lightning bolts, and the other is he had a book. He was keeping score for everybody. And I didn't believe in that God, and I still don't. Not, if you believe in that God, that's fine with me, but I don't, that didn't that didn't resonate with me. So I had doubt. But if you're having trouble and you're looking for a solution, you begin to recognize or you should begin to recognize somewhere there is an answer. And if you get to the right people like us and talk to them and find out what they 
how they, they arrived at where they are with their understanding. I don't want to ever tell anybody. I don't. It doesn't do any good for me to tell anybody how I arrived and what I believe, really. It's what you choose to arrive at and believe because you need to, you need to believe in the power that you define as God. And you, you, may, you ought to always be open, I think, to uh, changing your mind on that. I told the group that I came in with, I went to a bunch of old timers and told them, I said, I don't have any faith. I don't have any faith. They've told preachers and rabbis and priests have told me I need faith. And I don't have it. I've sat in a chair and decided I'm going to have faith. Mm. No faith. And they said, we don't give a damn whether you have faith or not. What we want you to do is to practice the program. Take the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and put them in your life. And when you have completed them, you will have developed a faith. You will have an understanding in God as you understand Him. And that happened to me. Uh, different in the part from where I started, but they, they told me to make a list of things I could believe and things I could, did not believe. I had a long list of I don't believes and a short list of what I could believe. And they told me I'd been spent my life in no man's land halfway between what I didn't believe and what I could believe and throw the, the list away about what I didn't believe but be willing to bring things over to what I do believe as I go along and go with what I do believe. So that's, that's a long answer to a question that probably didn't answer it, but it's the best I can do. I think we're born with the need for, get, for doubt. How do you keep the desire for continuous growth, seeking, growing at all times? Well, I don't at all times, but I do continue to have a need to grow because I encounter different aspects of life that I had never encountered before. And they can be stressful. I had came up with leukemia a few years ago. And for a few years, or maybe a few years, a while anyway, uh, I woke up every morning wondering if this is the day the leukemia was going to come back and, and get me. And then one day I woke up and looked out, and it was a pretty day. And I thought, I'm not going to screw this day up worrying about when I'm going to die. So I had to face death. My old mentor, Bob White, I told him one time I thought I had discovered my most basic, most basic fear. And the fear was I was going to lose my identity when I died. I didn't want to be a drop of water going back in the ocean. I wanted to stay Jerry Jones and appreciate what I'd accomplished in my life. And he laughed at me, and he said, well, hey, let me tell you what. He said, he called everybody Sugar Boy. He said, Sugar Boy, he said, I have a, my wife brings an expert into town every week to talk at our little chapel. Each of them has a different idea what it's going to be like, and I don't want to be morbid. Hell, I can't. I can't hardly wait. And said, guess what? Guess what? If nothing's there and... I'm dead. It won't matter because I won't know it. Took a lot of my fear away. And I needed to grow beyond that, that one point I had. So the program keeps giving me things that move me along in th this life. And uh, I think it happens to all of us. If God doesn't make too hard of terms for those who see seek Him, and God can only be found in the present moment. Why is it so hard to remain in the present? Because we are human and we have active alcoholic minds which zip around thinking about 30 seconds, about 30 things in 30 seconds, I think. I don't know why God does things. Uh, I don't think anybody really knows why God does things. To me, this entity called God 
is constant. And if I lend myself to the principles that God has given us, my life goes forward and I have what I need to be reasonably comfortable in, in my life. And I'm pretty sure that works for a lot of people because I see people that have a lot more difficult lives than I've had who are happy and content with what they, what they do. Uh, and I believe, I believe God sets certain things in motion, life. I, I personally don't believe God controls everything that happens. Now, Sandy does, but I, I, I don't believe a lot in predestination. I think we're kind of a free-flowing deal, and we go different places, but we're all going to wind up the same place. And uh, anyway, that's my view on that. God, I'm moving right along here. There's not as many as I thought there were. I know, I knew Sandy would edit this thing some because he's afraid of what I'd say. Uh, how spiritual awake are you? 2009, 20, 2090? Wait a minute. Oh, it's percentage. 20%, 50%, or 72%. How spiritually awake am I? Which day? Which day? Some days I'm pretty spiritually awake. Some days I feel close to the power. Anytime I allow myself to drift off into the material world and get to thinking about money and status and prestige and those things that we all kind of think about from time to time, worrying about what somebody thinks about me, I go way down. I'm not very awake. Uh, and I tend to react like an ottoman, a robot. You push this button and you get this on this subject. When I'm, uh, that's, what I, that's the way I lived. I was asleep when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I had no feeling of connectedness to anything no awakening now I can experience something and I'm awake enough to know this is self-centeredness is kicking in and my solution for self-centeredness is to get away from it so on that day I'm probably 70% and at what period of the time the older I've got the more time I can spend in that that higher arena but I have less material problems today than I did. Now, my grandkids are all screwed up right now. They've come back on me, and God, God I guess, has sent them back to stress me a little bit to see if I can get back on track. But uh, most my life's been pretty comfortable for the last 15 years. I, I can't even remember why I worked. Uh, <laughs> seems like such a waste of time to, to me. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of people identified with me here, I believe. Yeah. But that, that's, that's where I am. You can tell. I'm in the 20% range today. I'm, I'm, I'd do better if I was up to 70. When did the keep coming back chant start? From where? I haven't got a clue. I don't think it when I first came to Al you're talking I assume we're talking about at the end of the uh, Lord's Prayer it, when we finish up the, the meeting when we everybody you know keep coming back it works uh, I think I encountered that in probably the first 10 years of my sobriety but where it came from I honestly don't know it seems to be everywhere I've been uh, does anybody know more specifically than that, I, I sure don't have any idea. Here is a spiritual question. <laughs> Who 
who, who did this? Uh, <laughs> What is the meaning of spirituality? Well, I just did a little work on that not too long ago, trying to figure that out. And they say in the book or dictionary or something, it's of the Spirit. Uh, to me, spirituality is that part of life that is separate and apart from the physical or the material. It's that higher form of consciousness which we all possess. Uh, Dr. Silkworth talks about a psychic change. And it's that part of our, to me, this is that part of our makeup that allows me to begin to think on a different level and pursue different values than once dominated my life. Uh, I think it involves things like love. I think it involves things like the spirit of unity and fellowship. I think it involves honesty, the principles of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, none of which can really be picked up or held in our hands or seen you see just evidence of it. It is an outgrowth of the right of right living, I think. But it's to find it's of the spirit of man, of his made, highest and best part of his mind and of his being. And it, if actually there's a debate goes on whether our consciousness comes from our brain or from outside our brain. And it may be that part of the universe which which we might call our soul a higher finer part of me that part of you you can't screw up no matter what you've done or where you've been there's a part of you you just can't screw up if you do what you're asked to do in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous you'll free yourself from a lot of these things and as Sandy pointed out those terrible things you did become your greatest assets in a moment the moment you accept them and recognize what they are, they change from liabilities to assets, and they're useful only to help someone else find their highest and best meaning and free them from a lot of guilt and things. Poor answer, tough question. Did you ever go through periods in which you your prayer life was lackluster and not in earnest. What do you do to turn that around? Yes, I have and I do. There's a, you know, if you do things over and over, it gets to be kind of habit. And you kind of fall into the, I kind of fall into the same pattern. Read the same books. Bob here sent me a a collection of daily meditations. Uh, some of those daily meditations I read every day. Some of those med they, some of those I don't care a lot about reading every day. But I always I can tell when I get off the beam. When I get off the beam, I begin to be uncomfortable in in this life, and I have to find some way to go back and get there. And prayer is a major major way I, I do that. My wife is a she's she's a really prayerful person. She's a we go to a a church called the Unity Church and they have a, a silent unity that prays twenty four hours a day to people that send it to them. And they have good results. People send in their prayers and they uh they get good results. They've even done some scientific studies which are I would say render prayer as a probable activator of, of things. But there's controversy. There's other people that say they've done their side their their kinds of prayer and and it doesn't work. So what I usually when I get in trouble I start praying. 
generally it's when things are not going quite the way I wanted them to go that I begin to think about trying to to pray. And I'm really handicapped in this because the 11th step tells me what I got to pray for. I got to pray for God's will. And somebody, we were talking at lunch today, and I know what God's will is for me. God's will for me is to work the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous in all my affairs the rest of my life. That's, that's, I really do believe that because that gave me the greatest change in my life that I've ever experienced. And uh, so, and that part of prayer, just thinking about it, you know, it's, it never would have occurred to me for somebody, a client or some friend to call me and tell me about a problem and for me to say, well, could we pray about that? But I do that some. I do that when I feel like it's appropriate and somebody wants to pray. I believe in prayer and I believe that I need to change my focus from time to time uh, and read different material, use a different thing, meditate a little different way, just to keep myself fresh. We are now down to the white paper. I don't know the significance of the white versus the yellow paper, but we're there. These may be things sent to me by somebody like Clancy, about like uh, our, our great man Sandy. I feel about 98% free. However, there's just about 2% of me that questions whether I'm ever going to be completely reconcile my, my past. Most of the time, I accept the 2% as my alcoholism telling me that I still have alcoholism. Is this normal or am I still so uh, somewhat spiritually deficient? Well, I gather this is being free from your past. I don't know that we ever get totally free from regrets about what we did in our past. The evidence of those things tend to show up from time to time. I um, had a 16-year-old boy when I got sober. And occasionally he will mention something that I did or said or whatever that was harmful to him back in the beginning, or back before sobriety. And I regret what I did. And I've done everything I can think of to fix that. But to be totally honest, anytime one of those things comes up, I feel a little tightness. I don't think I'm ever going to be totally free. Maybe I'm not supposed to be. Maybe that little tug that I have helps me not do it again or reminded me the last time I did it that it didn't come out too good. Uh, so I think you have to kind of look at that not as a deficit but as maybe a, a little asset to keep nudging you back on the trail. You know, we we wind up out in the weeds from time to time. You can think you're going along in this program just doing fine, but when you look around one day and you're out in the weeds and you're very uncomfortable. And my experience is that when I recognize that and find it and begin to turn back to get on the trail, which is God's will, the steps, my, my life in AA, when I turn back on the trail, I don't have to get all the way back on the trail before I feel good. I begin to feel good right away. I begin to feel like I'm on the right road and things are going to be all right. So I think, I think the answer to the question is that you're probably about like all of us. I think we all have some things we wish you hadn't done, wish it's places we hadn't been, things we hadn't done to other people. But I think that helps us not do it again and reminds us always that we're on a, 
on a new new way of going on a new trail. Is the soul that is said to arrive at birth different from the eternal spirit? If so, how? This is a pure damned if I know question. <laughs> What is a soul? What is a soul? To me, it's that higher part of my thinking and acting, my emotions, that, that upper frame of things that fit in God's kingdom and don't produce anything but good results. It's, a, it's an activator to me. It's an essence to me. But is it different from the one I was born with? I have no idea. I don't know when I got it. I only know that there's a part of me that seems to not, that that observes my thinking. The observe I call him the observer. I think some people call him the committee. But he's watching me, or she, or it is watching me all the time, and my thoughts. If I'm aware, when I begin to think and get off going into the weeds, it'll check me and start me back. That's as near as I know. The only evidence I have of some entity that I might call a soul. They, you know, they've tried to weigh bodies before and a moment after death to see if the body weighs any less absent a soul. Well, I don't know when the soul leaves the body. Somebody's making the assumption it does on death, but it, it may be 15 minutes later or 37 and a half seconds. I don't have any idea. I think these are kind of questions, and I'm not critical of this at all because I have some of these same thoughts from time to time. But we spend a lot of time I spend a lot of time, spend a whole bunch of my time wondering, who is God? What is God? Where is God? And there's no good answers to those questions. To me, I find things that I attribute to God, evidence of God, but what form does he take? Where does he live? I, I go back to the book where it says God is everything or God is nothing. Which, what's your choice going to be? Take a pick. Well, I choose God is everything. And that means that you and I all are a part of God. The God that we seek resides in us and works through us. There's a story about a World War II statue in Italy or somewhere where it was a the Christ was on a sitting, looking over a city or something, and somebody in the World War II hit it with an artillery shell or a bomb and blew it to pieces. And they very carefully gathered the pieces up, and after the war they stuck them back together. Giant gigs, jigsaw puzzle. But they got it back together, everything except the hands. And they put a little sign on the bottom of it that says, you are his hands. So I think this part of us exists in us and is, we are, we are the people who carry out God's will. We discern it through the principles that we live by, the values that we have, and we, as we pursue those, we take actions which are in accordance with what God would have us do. How do we work on forgiving others? Well, I think the way I work on forgiving others is I, uh, I t tend to understand them and identify with what they have done to me. And the best time for me to gain forgiveness is after I've done a fourth and fifth step when I'm looking at six and seven. And I know where I have wronged and what, I, what my part has been in all this. 
So I got to give them the same break they give me. The fourth step prayer says, you know, you pray for people as though they were a sick friend. Well, I was a sick friend. I did a lot of things that I'm not proud of at all. And I really think that, uh, I really think that that's the way I forgive. I think, happen to think that forgiveness, surrender, acceptance are all the same thing with a different with a different name attached. It's a letting go of something, turning it loose, floating free from memory of something that's happened or a condition that I find myself in. And I, that's the way I can forgive. I, uh, I was in better shape to forgive people when I got sober and did the fourth and fifth step than I maybe have ever been. I, uh, I suddenly began to realize I, I had one, one amend that I wasn't going to make. I had a resentment, but I was not going to go to that guy and, uh, make amends to him because he had done a hell of a lot more to me than I had done to him in my estimation. I couldn't see anything that I had done wrong. He was a senior partner of mine, and he was, wasn't a senior partner of mine. He was my boss. And I had carried his briefcase and filed his briefs and done all kinds of things for him. He said, I couldn't practice law without you. And then one day he said, I'm leaving the law firm, but I'm not taking you with me. Well, I didn't want to go with him, but I deserved to be asked. I busted my ass, and he here he is walking off, and he's not even asking me to go with him. Well, a year and a half later, I'd already done my four step. He was he was not included. He was a sick friend, and I prayed a little for him. Uh, <laughs> And I went to a, I went to a restaurant in Lubbock, Texas, that we had been in at one point when I was working with him or for him. And I remembered the last time I was there. We had been in the middle of a trial, and we were the other lawyers on the other side had called us down to talk about settlement, and we did. They were just going to drink a while, and that's what we did. And I drank. Some before I got there, and some after I got there, and and uh, I had a spiritual experience there. Uh, I saw the first go-go dancer that I had ever seen. She had an interesting costume. She had flames coming out of various places in her body that was really intriguing, and she moved well. As she took certain steps, I had a spiritual awakening, and. Uh, she came over after the dance and sat down beside me. And uh, in a little bit, she said, would you like to dance? Well, I didn't know how to dance the way she was dancing, but she said, we'll just dance. And so we just danced. And at the table with me was our client, who was a primary lawyer for the Murkison family, which was a wealthy family in Dallas. They had hired my partner, and I, he was president of the State Bar of Texas at the time. And I was a tag along. And we danced a little bit, and she said, I'm really hungry. And I said, well, we all should all go somewhere and get something to eat. I was, you know, kind-hearted, trying to be helpful. And <laughs> she, uh, I rounded the boys and the Murkison's representative and my state bar president took them to a restaurant, this restaurant, and uh, she uh, she liked to tell jokes, sort of off-color jokes, and she talked loudly, and people looked at us, and uh, it got embarrassing enough to me that I didn't pursue this any further. I decided I better check out. But as I walked in that restaurant, I thought, you know, 
I know why that guy didn't ask me to go with him. He knew he had a young, budding alcoholic working for him, and he was going to start a new firm, and he didn't need a young drunk going along bringing go-go girls to meet with big clients. So I went back and found him and told him that I was sorry about all those bad things I'd said about him in the intervening years and uh, and talked to him about how I would like to make amends for him. But I couldn't see that until I had that that experience. It took a while for me to to get to where I was going. I've enjoyed talking to you all. I gather none of you have any other experiences or any questions you want to ask. And I want to thank you. I'm sorry I didn't have time to correct all of Sandy's mistakes this morning, but uh, it's all right, isn't it, Howard? Okay, thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.